welcome to Outdoor Photography Guide Live for October. My name is Lilia Khalif and I'm your question moderator for today. And I'd like to give a quick shout out to Tamron and thank them for sponsoring this live event. You may notice that I am in the studio all alone and that is because Ian is actually on location in Uganda and we have him called in. So we're gonna Skype him from Uganda and talk to him, see what he's up to, see what he's been shooting. So Ian, let's go to you and see how you are in Uganda. Hey, thanks, Lilia. Thank you, everyone, for attending this special event of OPG Live. I am here live in Uganda with fellow outdoor photography guide, contributing photographer Zach Mills. And we have been on a photo safari for the past week and a half. We spent the first week in Kenya photographing mostly big cats, but other wildlife as well. And now we are in Uganda trekking with mountain gorillas, a critically endangered species, but one of the most incredible wildlife species to photograph on the planet. It's really been an exciting adventure so far. We just finished up trekking a few hours ago and we have one more trek scheduled for tomorrow. We're also here, but we're just gonna give a quick shout out to a good friend of mine. He's a professional landscape photographer uh, from Israel. His name is Erez Maron. And he's gonna peek in real quick oh. and say hello. <laughs> Hey guys. <laughs> so you've got a thriller on this one. Uh, he's not going to join us for most of the event, but he just I wanted to introduce him. You should check out his website at uh, erezmarom.com. That's E-R-E-Z-M-A-R-O-M. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Erez. Right. Good, Good to see you. All right. We're all trapped inside a hotel room right now. We were going to do this event outdoors. Our hotel has a beautiful view of the, the volcano in the background where we do the gorilla trekking, but it has been raining nonstop all day. So we've retreated into the hotel room. And just a fair warning, there has been uh, some flickering of the power on and off. So if everything suddenly goes dark, don't worry. We have an artificial light with batteries lighting us up. So this is all part of the exciting real world experience of a professional photographer that we're bringing to you here in this episode of OPG Live. Exciting live drama right here, right now. <laughs> All right, you have some photos for, that you were taking recently in Uganda and Kenda, the, Kenya that we can go into right now if you guys are ready to talk about them. Yes, definitely. We're going to talk about some of the photos we've been taking, and I encourage everyone to send in questions uh, specifically related to the photos that we've taken or if you've got some more general questions about wildlife photography or photography overall. And uh, whenever we get some good questions in, Lilia will interrupt us and ask your questions. We're here to help as much as we can as possible. Why don't we go ahead and start with the photos? All right, we're pulling up the first photo here. We got, it looks like a cheetah grabbing the neck of some poor animal being eaten here. Well, that's actually uh, not a cheetah, it's a leopard. But this first photo was taken by Zach. So I'm gonna let him describe where we were and what was happening in this photo and what his approach was. Zach, take it away. Thank you, Ian. So this photo happened in my second home my second favorite place on the planet in Kenya and Masai Mara National Reserve. We spent a, lot, a week there also in the adjoining conservancies. And the thing you need to know about Masai Mara is if you've ever seen the cartoon, The Lion King, uh, sorry, The Lion King, exactly like the real life version. Everywhere you look, there's big cats, elephants, there's a wildebeest migration. It's just an incredible place to see and experience and to photograph, which is why we were there and we've been there many times in the past. So in this particular case, you know, it sometimes can be very difficult to spot the leopard in Masai Mara in Kenya. The reason being there's so many lions around and you know, lion is the top predator and can kill the leopard. So it can be difficult to, to spot and normally they're in the bush. And uh, we work with uh, Maasai guides, local guides who are top notch uh, experts uh, guiding many people around. So this one I'm particularly proud of because I spotted the leopard and uh, it doesn't happen often, but uh, you go there long enough and you become accustomed what to sort of look for. So that we spotted the, le I spotted the leopard in the bush. Just, though I just have to interject here. Uh, so you'll feel better, Lilia. When he spotted the leopard, he too thought it was a cheetah. <laughs> oh, you know, there you go. you're similar. <laughs> they can be a bit similar, especially when one is, a, one of them is uh, obstructed by the bush. But anyways, we spotted it and uh, turns out it had just made a kill. Now, some people get a little queasy, but we remind everyone this is the circle of life. The big cats, the lion, leopards, and cheetahs, <laughs> they are predators and that's the only food that they eat. So they if you like seeing babies, that's how it happens. 
And uh, this particular victim was a gazelle. So it had, we didn't see the kill itself, but we saw the leopard dragging the gazelle. Um, and usually a leopard will drag a gazelle up a tree to keep it safe from other predators who want to steal it away. Um, so this particular moment was when the leopard was dragging the gazelle to the tree. And it's just quite a powerful symbol of the relationship, relationship between uh, predator and prey. Though I'd hardly call it a relationship. It seems a it's little- It's very one-sided, <laughs> uh, you know, but it does exist. I can see the conversation between the gazelle and the leopard. It's like, no leopard, I'm just, I'm always giving and all you do is take, take, take. Yeah. Bad relationship. It's not a good relationship <laughs> for the gazelle. Yeah. All right, very interesting. Yeah. We'll go into our next photo here, which is oh. another, I'm gonna say leopard in a tree. All right. You got that one right. This is the same leopard. This is the leopard head. Uh, brought the gazelle up into the tree. Actually, it was pretty interesting. The leopard dragged the gazelle up into the tree, and they do that, as, as Zach mentioned, to keep uh, the food away from other predators, bigger predators like lions who might uh, kick them off of the kill. And uh, it was very windy, so the gazelle actually dropped out of the tree, and the leopard had to go all the way back down and drag it back up again. So it was pretty exhausted by the time it got the gazelle in place in the tree, so it decided to take a nap. And we sat there for several hours waiting for the cat to wake up. And it was a very chaotic scene because there were branches everywhere when the leopard was up in the tree. So we managed to get our safari vehicle positioned so that we had a pretty good open view of the leopard's face. And then at one moment it woke up and it looked around it, it was looking out and seeing probably about five or six safari vehicles at the time. Cause uh, when everyone learns about a leopard sighting, they all show My up. My leopard sighting. Yes, his leopard sighting. <laughs> And um, I waited for the moment for the leopard to open those big, wide, saucer-like eyes. And that's when I took the shot, because I knew that that eye contact would help uh, focus the viewer's attention on the leopard's face and reduce the visual clutter that was in the background of the scene. All right, we have a few questions in the chat. So our first right. one is, how do you stay safe in Africa, and are you ever worried about animal attacks? I'll let you answer the <laughs> <laughs> great question. I can tell you that your safety is 100% guaranteed. And that's because we are in a safari vehicle. And uh, we are not allowed to go outside of the safari vehicle due to concerns about our safety. Um, but because the animals are accustomed to the vehicle, you know, there's no, there's never been any documented attack where we go uh, or anything of that nature. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, there have been some uh, cases in other parts of Africa where a tourist might be hanging an arm out of a window carelessly <laughs> and uh, a friend will come up and grab them and pull them out. That does happen on occasion, but usually the best way to avoid that is just don't hang your arm out the window. <laughs> and one <laughs> We're not alone. We're working with uh, professional guides who are accredited and, you know, really care about the clients. So we work with guides and they keep you safe. Yeah. All right, and then question for both of you on both of those shots we just saw. What lenses are you using to shoot the leopard here? Zach, take it away for the first one. Uh, I'm using a zoom telephoto lens, the 200 to 400 millimeter by Canon. And what was great about this lens is as the leopard was approaching us, I was able to zoom out a bit to make sure that the photo was not too tight. Um, so that was my lens in that photo. And for me, I was uh, shooting with Tamron's new 100 to 400 millimeter lens. All right. We'll go into the next photo then. That's all for questions for right now. Let's see, we're pulling it up. This is a lion in some blue lighting in the grass. Well, you, you, got, you got all of that correct. That is indeed a lion. The I can pick out a lion. That's the easiest of the big cats to pick out. <laughs> and so I made this photograph at twilight. We, uh, we found a pair of male lions. I think that was... Uh, uh, two brothers, maybe? That, yes, yeah. one was there was close yeah. by. Yeah, so we had this pair of lions, and it was in it was uh, towards the end of the day. So we're, we were moving from daylight into that blue hour of twilight, uh, which is um, really uh, interesting. If you select a white balance that preserves that blue light rather than trying to get rid of it, you can get creative with the, uh, the color cast. And then I used just a little bit of flash, like flash at barely any power. Like I, I set the flash to manual, and took it out to like one one twenty eight one one twenty eighth power, which you know barely makes any light at all. All I wanted, I didn't want to illuminate the scene, I didn't want to illuminate the lion. All I wanted to do was get the catch light in the lion's eyes. So I reduced the power to the barest minimum, and I shot this. I used a cool white balance, 
to preserve those blue twilight tones, got the catch light in the eye just to attract the viewer's attention to the lion. Maybe I just want to join in here because I love this photo by Ian. And he I, likes, want, he likes I do, <laughs> but I want to emphasize this was his vision. Like he's had this photo in mind from the onset. He selected the, the white balance beforehand. He didn't leave it at auto. And he really executed this vision. Whereas I was just watching him wondering what he was taking the photo, how it was going to turn out. So this is a credit to really visualizing beforehand, before you're in the field, what you're trying to get. As a photographer, you always have to think about how your equipment is going to see this scene because the camera, the lenses, all of these things can see the things that you see with your eyes in a much different way. So your choice of exposure, your choice of focal length, your choice of white balance can all be used creatively to deviate from what your eyes are seeing in the real world. Can we reiterate quick, did you say you used a tiny little bit of flash or no flash at all? We have a question. Just a tiny that. little bit of flash. Okay, Just and so for your tiny little bit of flash, Debbie asks, was that the flash on your camera or was it a separate mounted light you brought with? It was a separate flash. My camera doesn't actually have a pop-up flash or anything like that. So I have a, a flash that I mounted the camera and uh, that's what I was using. So it was a, it was a uh, independent stroke. All right, sounds good. I think we're ready to go into the next photo here. We'll pull it up. We have, I think this one is a little harder for me to see, a lion flash lit. Um, it I've got a blue background. The line is lit in orangish. This is uh, your shot, Zach? Yes, excellently described. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite word now is orangish. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that I love to do is work at the edge of light after the sun has set or before it rises in the morning. And it's during the time of day where there's still a lot of twilight in the sky. So you can get some blues, some pinkish hues, many different variety of colors that are very soft in nature. And the thing you need to keep in mind with this photo, it wasn't really that dark to the naked eye. So the ambient light was much stronger. But here I had a vision in my mind where I really wanted to increase the dynamic range of the shot. So if I just photographed the lion, um, the sky would not look nearly as well. Similarly, if I photographed the sky, the lion would have been completely dark. So used a little bit of fill flash to increase the dynamic range of the photo. And what I really like is this contrast and the colors between the lion, which takes on this orange yellowish hue and the blue twilight and just the cloud pattern behind it. Um, so it's sort of unmasking the darkness, if you will, by using this technique at, at twilight. All right, very interesting. We'll go on to the next photo here. I'm assuming we're alternating, so this is probably Ian's. I'm gonna guess a cheetah, that's my big cat guess, in a tree with a lot of foliage going on. It is a cheetah. This is actually a cheetah cub. We found a cheetah with three little cubs and they were hunting in the morning. And cheetahs love to get up on a high vantage point so they can look for prey. Now the, the parent cheetahs do this. They're very serious going about their business of finding food. The young cheetahs do it just for fun. <laughs> so cheetahs were playing on this, uh, this small tree that was growing out of a termite mound. And so there was a moment where one of the cubs came up all the way to the top of the tree and was surveying his domain, his future domain when he grew up and became king of the cheetahs, or perhaps <laughs> queen, I have no idea. Uh, so, you know, this isn't, I, it's just a fun shot. I just, it's a, it's a baby cheetah. I mean, who doesn't love baby How cheetahs? How can you go so, wrong but, there? Sort of like <laughs> cheetah parkour going on. They just climb and stuff for yeah. the sake of it. <laughs> You know, if I had thought of that, I would have, I would have just, I would have appeared brilliant, but instead you're the one who gets the, uh, you could also yeah. say a cheetah lookout station. Yeah, well, yeah, her, cheetah parkour is I think Sorry. parkour just like rolls off the tongue a little better. There you go. Free <laughs> title for that photo. Cheetah parkour. <laughs> All right. We'll go into the next photo here. We'll pull that up. This is a lion got some steam or some kind of dust going around here in an orange light backlit. Yes, this would be Zach's. Also well described. Uh, so that is actually the lion's I can't breath. tell if you're looking at me sarcastically saying that or not, but I'm going to go with that it is actually well described. <laughs> yeah. um, it's actually the lion's breath. So it was early in the morning, the sun had just come up, and our, my strong advice to the viewers is to resist the temptation to front lit, you know, put the lion uh, facing uh, the sun can be much more interesting, artistic, creative, if you go for backlighting when you have strong sunlight and we are fortunate to have it this particular morning. And uh, what's interesting also is where we are, it can cools down quite substantially at night. 
And uh, in the morning, you know, you definitely need a jacket. It's quite cool. And with the strong light, sometimes there's mist on the ground. And when you're shooting into the light, you can see the line's breath as it's exhaling. So this moment comes together because the lion was walking across uh, the scene in front of us and there were some shrubs in the foreground um, that were darkened out when I purposely underexposed. So I underexposed just a little bit here um, to really emphasize the warm colors, the strong orange light that was coming in behind the line. All right. I would just like to add quick that Debbie in the chat says, orangish, I love it. So orangish is catching on. Feel free to use that to describe any orange photos you see from now on. So well, we'll go. Some of these words now. So we have to find a way to mix orange orangish with parkour. So orangish and parkour. Parkourangish? I don't know. Take it or leave it. Um, another question from Debbie here asking, are you using any filters to get the exposure on these photos? Uh, no, none no whatsoever. filters. No filters, none whatsoever. Yeah. It's a oh. combination of natural light and uh, just choice of white balance. All right. We'll go into yeah. the next photo then. Pull that up. We've got some elephants and a little parade going with an orangish background fading into purple up higher. Are the elephants doing any parkour? No, they look like they're just meandering. Okay, well, if it's meandering elephants, then it's probably my <laughs> shot. So uh, this was shot at sunset, and sunsets in the Mara can be amazing because usually during the heat of the day, these beautiful storm clouds, uh, and the result can be magical. So usually what we're thinking of doing when we're photographing wildlife is to go a little bit wider to show some of that context, to show that beautiful sky, the colors in the sky, the texture in the clouds. So these elephants were, were pretty far away. And so what I mean by going wider for this particular shot is that I didn't zoom in my telephoto lens all the way just to capture the elephants. I zoomed out a bit so that I could include a lot of the color and the drama of the stormy sky. And we intentionally chose a position where the elephants were passing uh, against the most colorful and brightest part of the sky. And it took a lot of creative positioning with our safari vehicle. You know, this doesn't work unless the elephants are on a bit of a ridge or a hill. So if you've got animals that are down in the landscape and they're not silhouetted, silhouetted against the sky, the technique just doesn't work that well. So we were lucky we found some elephants that were walking across on this ridge. It did take us a little while to get the right position, but once we did and they crossed over, uh, then it was just right, waiting for the right moment. And I chose this particular moment because these elephants were walking along and they were all bunched up and they were merging together visually, which wasn't very good. But there was a moment where they spread out and you can see all three distinct elephants. And the elephant in the middle, the big one, also had a really nice pose. So that was the perfect moment. I had the right pose, the right composition, the right color, and just the right light. The one thing... Sorry, what I like about this photo is, you know, there's a tendency to shoot everything in the middle of the frame, middle of the scene. And Ian, by placing it at the bottom, I think creates more visual intrigue and uh, sort of differentiates from just going for the standard sort of approach. Yeah, it makes the composition a bit more dynamic. And it also allowed me to include a lot of those colorful dramatic storm clouds, which to me were uh, a vitally important part of the composition. All right, we got a question in the chat here. Did you guys use any fill flash on any of these photos on your trip? So whenever we do use fill flash, we'll, we'll let you know. Uh, so we do uh, use fill flash on occasion and um, we'll make sure that whenever we describe any photos that do use fill flash, that we'll mention it. All right, then we'll go into the next photo. We'll see if you use fill flash in it or not. Probably not, let's see. This one is harder for me to see too. A crocodile at night. I think. Nope. <laughs> They're oh, no. shaking their head at me in the studio. No. <laughs> Blue in the front, lit in the center. I'm going to guess we were just on Ian's photo. This is a Zach photo. Guys, help me out here. It's a little tricky because the lion is a bit smaller in this scene. So okay, I here to, to my credit, I see the photo very far away, so I don't yeah. know where Crocodile came from. Take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> It's the big pointy teeth. They both have them. I don't know. At the front, you got a lot of blue going on here with some contrast, made it look like water, gave me a different vibe. Anyway, there is water. Okay, so this is uh, an example of using a little bit of fill light in the scene. Um, so similar to that last lion photo I talked about um, at the twilight, this is another example of another lion at twilight where uh, we've been watching these lions and they're mostly uh, sleeping, usually 
can be that male lions that are not so active during the day. So we spend a lot of time just sitting around watching them, uh, you know, hoping that something more exciting would happen. And sure enough, it did. So they got up one by one and went down to this water hole to start drinking water. And what I particularly like about this photo is it was at the twilight. Um, so we had blues in the sky and the blues were reflecting off of the pool of water. So as the lion is there drinking the water, we used a little bit of fill light um, and underexposed uh, the scene to capture the lion, the, the last remaining twilight in the sky and the reflective uh, blue color in the water. This is sort of how it all came together. What I really like about the shot is that the, the reflection of the blue in the water creates this dynamic shape. So the, the blue water shape is revealed by the fact that it's surrounded by shadow on either side. And the shape is what makes this shot so compelling. I mean, it's great to have a, a lion go down and drinking water reflected in a still pool, but it's the, the triangle shape created by that blue color that pops out from the, re, the surrounding silhouette that really makes this shot work. All right, we'll go on to the next photo here. This one I can clearly see is a backlit lion. It is not a crocodile, in fact, it's in the grass. <laughs> it's orange-ish, uh, but I don't think it's going to be doing any parkour anytime soon. No, this it guy look had, like it. Yeah, this, uh, this lion definitely had some bad injuries. Uh, if you look at the photo closely, you can see that one of its eyes is missing. And also we noticed as it was walking along, it uh, had a limp. Uh, yeah, he looks I, I a like mangled. The, yeah, he's, he's definitely been mangled. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty sure the eye was missing. The, it seemed like the eye was closed, but I think I caught a glint of an empty eye socket in there. Uh, so he kind of reminds me of uh, Scar from The Lion King, I suppose. Oh. Um, he had also injured his paw, though, you know, these injuries happen a lot because uh, the lions are hunting these big uh, uh, animals like wildebeest, and though sometimes the wildebeest fight back. And the lions have this remarkable ability to heal, though I don't think his eyes growing back anytime soon. No, uh, <laughs> but um, I think with this lion, there is also suspicion that he was injured by another lion. Yeah, in the same pride, this okay. dominant alpha male, mm -hmm. uh, because apparently the suspicion was this one was getting a little too close to one of the females for the dominant male's uh, liking. Yeah. Yeah. So, so but they recover. Right. It's, yeah. it's really remarkable. So, you know, he, he was a little rough up, roughed up, maybe not the prettiest lion in the world, but I, I kind of like these ugly animals from time to time. And if you can get, get even an ugly animal, I'll just say he, he's not ugly. He's, he's, uh, he's different. He's charismatic. Yeah, character. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and catching even a, uh, uh, animal with character, in the right light and in the right conditions can be really powerful. So we had this really clear sunrise one morning and this brilliant, strong golden backlight. And uh, as soon as that light got high enough and it was backlighting the lion and all of the grass around him was glowing as if from within, from the backlighting. So there's this golden aura around the lion in the shot. So it's really a transformative event when you can get that strong, colorful backlighting at sunrise or sunset. And, you know, to get really good backlighting, you have to have clear light. You can't have that many clouds or haze or smoke in the air or anything like that. So we had that really strong, colorful light, and it really brought out the beauty of the scene. All right. We have a lion question in the chat, actually. Um, on any of the safaris that you go on, do they know the lions? Like, do they tra tag them or track them for health reasons? Do you go on any safaris that are keeping track of the animals while you're out there? Uh, a strong yes, uh, <laughs> because uh, all the, a lot of the lion, the prides are known, they're named. Mm -hmm. Some of the individual lions are named. So everyone knows them and their personality. But there's a lot to, there's several actual research organizations who've been working over the years who are consistently monitoring both the behavior, the size, the reach, the territory of these different prides of lions. So yeah. that is a, an active part of the process and we interact with them time to time. And you know, it's not entirely clear to, clear to me, but I don't think most of them are tagged or anything No, like they're that. not. But the lions have specific territories and they have a range within that territory where they will travel and hunt. So, and, and because you have so many guides working in the Mara who are, are finding the lions on a daily basis, everyone's got a pretty good idea where the lions are. And usually it's just a matter of going to that spot where they were seen last and searching around and you'll find them again eventually. 
And the last thing is every lion may look the same, but actually all the adults have very defining characteristics. So it's quite easy to tell them apart once you know what to look for. Especially one of them is missing an eye. Yeah, yeah it's a clear <laughs> indicator right there. <laughs> all right, we'll pull up the next photo here. We've got some elephants, one baby elephant, one larger elephant in an orangish light facing apart from each other. That's right. Uh, different set of elephants than the previous uh, one that you saw photographed by Ian. And this was another night uh, where, you know, that whole afternoon, you couldn't really find anything very good for photography. We were looking for the big cats, but, you know, sometimes they go on holiday and they're very elusive. <laughs> so we weren't really getting anything, sightings any good. And uh, we had heard that there were some cheetahs in the distance. So we were making our way over to them, sort of racing as the last light of day was coming in. But with that last light, we just sort of, we actually had car trouble. <laughs> so our engine broke down and uh, we sort of looked to our side and we saw that this, there was this layer of clouds that had built up above the horizon. And uh, that layer of clouds is usually a good indicator that there can be very strong light coming in underneath as the sun is about to set. And luckily for us, there was a herd of elephants right there. So keep in mind, our car, our safari vehicle broke down <laughs> and we weren't planning on shooting them at all. And uh, we sort of turn around and all everything came together very quickly because the elephants were actually facing the wrong direction. We had a lot of elephant butts uh, right through our... <laughs> And uh, then, you know, they assumed this profile position. Meanwhile, we had gotten a boost. And by boost, I mean another safari vehicle had come up behind us and started pushing us with the vehicle. A literal uh, boost. A little bit of momentum. <laughs> and then the engine was able to start. So <laughs> normally we have really bad elephant luck in the Mara. The yes. elephants can be very skittish. But on this particular trip, we had fantastic elephant luck. Hmm. And if it hadn't been for that engine breaking down at just the right moment yeah. when the elephants were passing by on this hill in front of that beautiful sunset, we wouldn't have gotten the shot. So we, we all came together within one or two minutes. And uh, what I really like is the profile perspective. You have the big and the small. They're facing different directions. And one thing that I really like about this photo is you see the full trunk. There were many photos that we took where the trunk of the elephant was dangling down and you couldn't really see any separation uh, between the ground and the trunk because it was all black. As uh, they often say with elephant photos, if you don't have the trunk, you got nothing but junk. <laughs> Some people, come on, that was hilarious, guys. <laughs> uh, I laughed at so, it. I thought it was funny. Thank you, Lilia. So that's how this thing came together. And it was only lasted for a few minutes. The elephants went their separate ways. We lost the light. We continued on to the cheetahs. And uh, I can tell you, we didn't get any good photos of the cheetahs because it was just not a good sighting. So sometimes luck is, uh, is your best friend. And uh, we used the opportunity presented to us to creatively take in the scene in front of us. All right, we'll go on to the next photo then. We've got some hyenas in a pile on the ground. Okay, well, that's my photo, and I included them because hyenas are often maligned. They are not exactly the prettiest animal out there, and for the most part, no one wants to photograph them. They've got faces that only a mother would love. <laughs> mother They've got hyena. a hunchback. In the photo, I happen to have a mother hyena with her cubs, and I, I did think it was a very cute moment. I actually love hyenas. I think they're beautiful animals. Uh, yeah, they're a little scary and freaky looking and kind of creepy, but... I, I do tend to like them, and when I get a chance, I like to photograph them. And we did have some nice backlighting. So I, uh, we positioned the safari vehicle. Zach wasn't interested in shooting the hyenas. He's a, he's a bit discriminatory, but I was all right. So I uh, asked our guide to position the vehicle so that we could take advantage of the backlighting. And then I used a little bit of fill flash just to balance the exposure so you can see more of the hyenas' faces and to get the catch lights in the eyes. I mean, I'm a fan of hyenas. I think more people should okay. photograph them. <laughs> we'll see if you have any more in this array of photos we've got here, but we'll go on to the next one. Hyenas are really good at parkour, by the way. Are they? So. Clearly a superior animal then. We've got a baby gorilla hanging by a vine, leaning back. So yes, we have been trekking with gorillas in Uganda for the past two days. We have one more to go. This is a photo by Zach. Take it away, Zach. 
there's few things I can say in my life that are as amazing as being with these mountain gorillas. They're such an iconic species. There's so few of them left. A few, like 15 years ago, their numbers were down to the 200s left in the whole world. Um, but thankfully, due to a lot of effort among many different parties, the strong uh, conservation efforts have paid off. Their numbers are now up to 1,000. But they're so human-like and so massive. And being around them just reminds you of your cousins, your uncles, your aunts, your family members. Um, they're just so unique. And uh, so we've had such a great experience trekking with them yesterday, today, and again, looking forward to tomorrow. And uh, what I like about this photo is there's a lot of energy. So this, these are the babies. There's one front and center. There's also another one off to the right-hand side, and the baby's got their hands out sort of in a diagonal position. Disco dancing. Disco dancing, some say, uh, parallel to the shoot of bamboo that's actually right above it. And I just like the energy that's brought together with these different visual elements into the scene. All right. Maybe that little gorilla is doing parkour. You never know. I'm getting wild with the bamboo back there. I can guarantee you that gorillas invented parkour. When Probably. You, see them in action. you know what? That sounds about right. All right, we'll go on to the next photo here. We've got a larger gorilla with a foot coming out in the left-hand corner, just chilling, sitting by some bamboo. This is uh, Zach again, so... Uh, that was the best description, by the way. I don't <laughs> think I can even... But... Uh, I was drawn, this is a dominant silverback and they're called silverbacks because once the males uh, reach the full adulthood, their back, the fur on their back actually turns this brilliant silver color. So that's where the name silverback comes from. And keep in mind that they're upwards of 400 pounds, some are over 500 pounds. So these are massive, massive animals. And uh, this particular one, you know, he had eaten a lot of bamboo. It's bamboo eating season here and he was just, chilling, his stomach was full, he was in a good mood, and it seemed like he was just kind of sitting out and watching what was going on, probably looking at us, wondering what we were doing. And what I like about this photo is the foot sort of adds to the scene. It gives it a bit of character, a bit of personality, and there's also a bit of a diagonal line uh, with the gorilla from the left to the right. So just, it's a fun shot, it's a personality shot, and I just love silverbacks and all the gorillas. All right, we have a question in the chat that I just saw, so I'm not sure which photo it's in reference to, but it's for either one of these gorilla photos. Um, it looks like it was a low light shot. Did you adjust with the ISO to get the low light? Great question, and the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, shooting gorillas is very difficult because uh, you can't control the time. Basically, it's very restricted access. You're only given one hour to spend with them once you and to photograph them. So, and we can't control the time because you start off trekking in the morning, it, it depends on their position in the forest. Sometimes you may track for 15 minutes, others maybe three hours, by which point it could be the middle of the day. So one strategy that we pursue um, is to go during the rainy season. And uh, we've had torrential rain the last little while, but uh, during the rainy season, usually it's overcast. There's a lot of clouds in the sky and this diffuses the bright sunlight because one thing I've learned is that gorillas in strong light just does not look good. Yeah, just imagine black fur with bright <laughs> silver faces. And so when the sunlight hits the gorillas, all you can see is the blown out highlights on the face and nothing else. It's, it's not a very good shot. So during the rainy season, uh, you have the risk of getting rained on, which is ever present. But the diffuse light also balances that strong light. And consequently, without strong light and diffuse light, uh, there's low light. <laughs> so uh, we often are shooting with a very high ISO. It's basically the only way to operate with the mountain gorillas. And, and that's something we just accept and use to our benefit and knowledge. So very what high I, ISO. What I do is I usually set my ISO to auto because as you're shooting, the light's often changing. Uh, the clouds may get thicker or they may get thinner. So that way with auto ISO, I don't have to constantly be changing my ISO to keep up with the changing light. And it's just one less thing to think about. Right. But yeah, sometimes we're shooting at ISO 3200, 6400. Uh, some cameras handle it better than others. So if you've got one of the, the newer, higher end digital cameras, especially the full frame cameras, they handle high ISO very well. Some older cameras, some less expensive cameras, maybe aren't gonna handle the high ISO quite as much. So if you are working in similar conditions, if you're trekking with gorillas, 
definitely you're going to want to have a lens that's got a really big wide open aperture. You know, the bigger, the better. An f2.8 lens is really fantastic. Uh, even wider is better than that, like an f1.4 or 1.7 lens. That lets in a lot more light and it keeps your camera from using those really high ISOs in the darkness. And with just to follow, to finish this point, uh, with the more light coming into the camera, it gives you a faster shutter speed. And that's the whole point why we need this high ISO is because the gorillas are moving and the only way to photograph them and get a sharp image is if your shutter speed is fast enough to keep up with them. And we're also shooting handheld. It's really yes. difficult to set up tripods in this area because, I mean, the gorillas are moving and the terrain is very uneven. So hand holding requires faster shutter speeds to make sure that you get sharp shots. All right. We also have a gorilla question in general. You guys have talked a lot about how comfortable you feel around the gorillas or that it's kind of like being around family. But um, there's a question in the chat asking, I've heard that you should not look them directly in the eye and they can get aggressive. So is this true? Is there some safety concerns you have to take yeah. around gorillas? With the silverback, the silverbacks are uh, territorial animals and they've got several females that they are mating with and they uh, often have to defend that uh, from other males. And so they do perceive direct eye contact as a challenge or they can perceive. Now the gorillas that are uh, uh, being seen by tourists in Uganda, Rwanda, and also uh, in the Congo uh, for the times when, when Congo is open to tourism, uh, they've all been habituated to people, so they're much more comfortable around people than, say, like a completely unhabituated wild silverback. And there are times when the silverbacks, they like to show off in front of the tourists. So they want to show their power, their strength, and their authority. So they, they might do something, uh, they might get a little naughty. So, for example, the other day, the silverback... Uh, grabbed a vine and tore it down and kind of threw it at us. And, uh, you know, for the most part, it's harmless. Uh, you know, I was trekking once in Rwanda where a, a silverback walked by and pushed over my tracker who was standing right next to me. Oh. So I almost got pushed over by a silverback gorilla. I came this close. And, um, you know, these things do happen, but they're not really doing them violently. It's just a little bit of dominance. They're just showing their power. And so, it, you know, no one, I don't think any, there's been any recorded injuries of the of the gorillas actually hurting anyone for the most part they're very uh very calm very stable uh just every now and then one of them might uh make a little bit of a threat display to let you know who's boss and it's always a good idea when that happens to lower your eyes but they don't perceive the camera as the same sort of challenge as eye contact might be so if you've got the camera to your face uh you're usually not uh making the uh, silverbacks nervous at all and just remember that we're with the professional guides at all times. We're communicating. They're telling us what to do, where to go. Yeah. And um, if there ever is any sign of behavior of aggression, they spot it before we do and are telling us to back up yeah. or often the case, kneel down. So yeah. when our physical size gets lower, it shows that we submit to the gorilla <laughs> and then he's satisfied that we all know who's boss. Yes. <laughs> when in doubt, shrink yourself. Make yourself smaller. Yeah. All right, good answer. We'll go on to our next photo. Pull it up here. We've got another gorilla chilling. This one's laying down, crossing his legs in the bamboo. Got his feet up. And this is a photo that I took yesterday. And what I love when I'm making wildlife photos, I love to capture those anthropomorphic moments, those moments where animals do something that reminds us of us. And uh, with the gorillas, it's kind of easy because they're very, very similar to people. And they've got a lot of the same mannerisms and the same facial expressions. And so when you see a gorilla lying on the ground with his feet up, uh, it's a really wonderful story to capture. So it's a pretty simple shot, nothing too fancy there. Uh, it's just when you, when you see these anthropomorphic moments, these moments where animals act uh, somewhat like humans or they seem to be acting like humans, it's a fun story to capture and it's a great way of creating an emotional connection between your viewers and your wildlife subjects. All right, we'll go into the next photo, pull it up. We've got a night sky. It looks like possibly a blanket, maybe a Maasai tribe member yes, on the bottom yes. there with a tree. Very good. Actually, this is one of our Maasai guides. And, and good friends, by yes, the way. Yes, yeah, very good friends. And um, so we have two guides who are with us and they're both great guys. And not only are they incredible guides, but they're just also the friendliest people you'll ever meet. 
the Maasai people are wonderful. And they graciously allow us on occasion to make photographs featuring them prominently in the shot. So this was a night sky shot uh, that uh, I've been thinking up about for a while. And we found a really cool tree and we positioned the one guy, his name is Daniel, under the tree and he had his Maasai uh, robe on. And we waited for it to get dark and we had the stars in the sky, the Milky Way above the tree. We selected a position knowing where the Milky Way was gonna be. So we figured all of that out ahead of time using a uh, photography app. I was using the photographer's ephemeris, which allowed us to figure out where the Milky Way was gonna be and when it was gonna be in a certain position in the sky. And then we just, once we got on location and we were getting set up, we had to work out a bunch of different variables. So the variables included composition, focus. Uh, these are very difficult things to do when it's pitch black out. So uh, a lot of times there's a lot of trial and error. You set up a shot, you think you got it right. You take a test shot, you find out you got it wrong. You keep trying until you get it right. So we went through a number of iterations where we kept changing our position, changing our focal lengths, uh, and changing our height. We started off at a pretty normal, you know, chest level uh, shooting, but we didn't like the way that the horizon intersected with Daniel. Uh, I was kind of cutting him off in the middle. So we kept getting lower and lower. And so finally, I was actually uh, completely on the ground with my camera. I had my tripod legs splayed out completely with a ground level setup. So my camera was maybe six inches above the ground. And that finally was the perfect position and everything came together. Now this was a 30 second exposure at ISO 6400, uh, and I was using F4. That was to capture the stars in the sky so that they appear to be relatively static. The, the Earth is always spinning, so if you do a long exposure, the stars will create trails in the sky. So if you can keep your exposure 30 seconds or less, they'll look more like pinpoints than they'll look like uh, trails. And then I used just a little bit of fill flash with a warm filter on the flash to illuminate Daniel in his Maasai robes. And we tried different positions where he would uh, hold up his robe in different ways. And this was the one I liked the most because he, he held up one arm and held up his robe and it created this nice triangle shape and that red color just popped out against that blue uh, uh, night sky. Meanwhile, I was looking for uh, on duty for dangerous animals <laughs> that may be coming close to us while we're not paying attention. <laughs> But thankfully, there was no problem. Yes, Zach's job was to provide a tasty alternative to me. <laughs> he got a steak in his pocket. <laughs> it's always safe to have a snack friend on standby if you're yes. worried about animals in the jungle. All right, well, you, we also, you, you, could you reiterate one more time what the app was that you used to track the night sky and the stars? Yes, it's called the Photographer's Ephemeris. Photographer's Ephemeris. So there you go, Debbie, yeah. remember that. There you go. We'll go into our next photo, pulling that up here. We've got two gorillas laying down in the grass, almost looking like they're holding hands. One has got their <laughs> foot crossed too. <laughs> so this was from uh, earlier today, just a few hours ago actually. And uh, mountain gorillas, I confess that I love them so much, but what was so special about this moment is you had a big silverback and a much smaller baby and they were play fighting together. It was actually one-sided. <laughs> the baby was play fighting with the dominant silverback and he went along with it for a little while. So they tumbled around, they had a few somersaults right in front of us. And in the end, they were holding hands and you see, if you zoom in far enough, you see the baby's eyes are kind of looking up at the camera and the silverback's eyes are closed, but his teeth are exposed. Looks like he's smiling in a gorilla type of way. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they both look very happy. They, they seem very happy. So you skip the very full extension from the baby to the, to the silverback. And then there's a two more gorillas you see in the distance. So this is an example of a behavior uh, type of scene, um, but filling the frame as well with interesting expressions and lots of different visual cues, cues to explore in this photo. Lots of stuff going on there. All right, we'll go into the next photo. We've got a silverback gorilla sitting very close to the camera with some other gorillas in the background. Also my shot, also from earlier today, and uh, same gorilla you saw play fighting in the other one. Eventually he got a bit tired of that and sent the little one to play fight with somebody else. And he sort of posed right in front of us. And you know, Going wide can work in certain situations. It's not for all situations by all accounts. And, and trekking with the mountain gorillas can be a bit challenging because the environment 
has its characteristics which make that difficult. But in this instance, uh, I was able to go a bit wide because I like the mountain gorilla, you know, getting a bit more into the scene. And what makes this photo, in my opinion, in addition to his intense sort of stare looking at me, which is fine on its own, but I really like the other members of the family popping out from behind him in the background. And if you notice, they're all sort of looking up, looking at the camera, looking at one another. So there's a lot of uh, lot going on in this photo. A lot of photos that I took didn't come together, where the male, the one in front, was staring at me, but the others were sort of off to the side, or they were merged together very tightly. And so this was just a moment being ready for all the conditions to, to come to fruition. Like most of the photos, just the right place, right time, get everything to line up just perfectly. Yeah. Get the stars yeah. to align. Photography is, is really all about patience because, you know, if you're working in a controlled environment like a studio, you can set everything up to be exactly the way you want it. But when you're in the outdoors, you're not in control of anything. The only thing you can control as a photographer is your artistic vision, what's going on here. And unfortunately, the real world doesn't always want to align with the creation you have in your head. So a lot of times it's just waiting for all these random and chaotic forces to come together in a way that closely matches what it is you're trying to get. All right, we'll pull up the next photo. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> No, that was fine. Sorry if that was a bad transition. We had a little, we had a tiny freeze of you on camera. I kept hearing your audio, but your face was static. Okay, I'll talk about the next photo here. We got a very big close up of a gorilla, just a tight face shot with a lot of fur around. Yes, I think this is the last photo that we'll be talking about today. So this was my photo from earlier today. And just, just so everyone knows, uh, these images have been processed on our laptops as we've been traveling. And you know, these really haven't been fully uh, color corrected at home on a professional uh, calibrated monitor. Um, so if, if you didn't like any of these photos, it's entirely because of the, the limited technology we're using. <laughs> uh, but for this shot, I went in tight. I, I saw this one old silverback who was kind of wrapping his arms around his face. He's a little shy. The other gorillas were much more friendly and they were smiling at us and everything like that. But this particular silverback was a little shy, so he kept hiding his face. And I really liked the way his arms were wrapping around his face and framing his face. So I went in tight with a telephoto zoom so that I could capture a picture just of his face and his arms and uh, create an artistic composition without having any of the background that uh, I thought would have distracted from what I was trying to accomplish with the shot. And uh, what I really like about this photo is by going in tight, Ian was able to create this natural vignetting type of effect. So the dark fur of the mountain gorilla is sort of all around the face and it draws the viewer's eye into the face. Um, so that was his vision and it comes up, in my opinion, quite nicely. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so that's it so far for our trip. We got one more day of trekking tomorrow. So we're hoping that we'll get some more incredible shots. We're always trying to push the envelope creatively. You know, it's not enough to rest on your laurels. It's not enough to look at what you've done before. You've always got to be asking yourself as a photographer, how can I make this shot even better? So when I'm in the field, personally, I will look at my photos every day if I can to see what I've done, to figure out what mistakes I've made and how I can do things better. And I'm always, always questioning to myself, how can I take this shot into an area that's even more creative than I've done before? Always moving forward is, is the way to do things. And I guess just the key point to summarize, we're not looking to get good photos. We're looking to get sort of those once in a lifetime type of shots that really wow and amaze people and ourselves. So we're always pushing the boundaries. A lot has to come together with the lighting, the composition, the behavior of the wildlife subject and the specific pose. So we always stay ready. We're experienced with our cameras. We can change them on the fly without thinking twice but we're always thinking creatively and artistically about how we can take something that no one else has photographed in this particular way that will really stand out. Okay, and we have a few more questions that we'll wrap up in the last few minutes here we have in the chat. Um, Ian, you mentioned just recently in the last photo having limited equipment while you're out in the field, but Debbie asks, do you feel the need to change lenses a lot during a shoot or do you have the need to interchange between equipment a lot? Yeah, this definitely comes up a lot. And uh, that's why I prefer to work with zoom lenses whenever I can instead of prime lenses, because that minimizes the need to change lenses. 
Uh, but when you're doing wildlife photography in particular, there's one element that's usually out of your control, and that's where the animal is going. And sometimes the animal will be farther away and you need a longer telephoto lens. Sometimes it'll come in close to you and you can work with a wide angle lens. Uh, so I'm often changing lenses when I'm in the field, though having zoom lenses and, and also knowing what is going to be your best lens for your subject, or at least having a good idea ahead of time, those things can help you from, uh, from having to change lenses all the time. But it happens and uh, you know, when, when you need to, you just, you just change the lens with the, uh, with the gorillas. I've got one lens on my camera and I have a porter who's nearby, who's carrying my equipment. So if I need to change the lens, I just, uh, uh, go over to him and I make a quick swap and then I'm back into position taking more photos. And the other thing that we do is sometimes we use two cameras. So actually we'll have a wide angle lens attached to one camera and then we'll have a more telephoto zoom lens attached to another camera. That way we're ready for any situation. All right, and our last question here is actually a threefold question. So William asks, one, how much does a Kenya safari cost? Two, what other times of, what other times of the year are good times to visit Kenya? And three, will you post any of the contact information you had for scheduling a safari in Kenya on this trip? Well, um, Zach, why don't you answer the questions about Kenya? Kenya's, uh, yeah, Zach goes to Kenya much more than I do. Yes, and if you're thinking about going to Kenya for a type of wildlife safari, there's no other place I would recommend above Masai Mara. It's just such a special place. I think I've been around 15 to 20 times now, and every time I go, I see something new and exciting and interesting. The cost uh, varies. It's not necessarily a budget destination by any means, but depending on how long you uh, want to go, what time of year, which I'll come back to in a second, and uh, the type of experience that you want to have, whether it's with other people or your sort of own private vehicle, these are all factors that contribute to different price points. Um, so uh, if you're interested in pursuing this further, I actually, we do work with a really great guide. I've been working with him since the very beginning. I've got to know his family and there's very, very special people. He spent some time working with the BBC and he is on call for many photographers around the world who work with him exclusively. So we'll look into a way to post his uh, contact information. Regarding the timing of the year, this is very important. So in Masai Mara in uh, particular, you want to avoid April to June. That is the rainy season. And while it can be fun to get animals and big cats and elephants and giraffes, et cetera, in the rain, the rains are typically so heavy that the roads become very difficult to pass. And, and in the Masai Mara, which is a big reserve, um, in the safari vehicles, we're often crossing rivers to get to different parts of the park, but during the rainy season, the river, the water is so high that you can't actually do that. So you're very limited in your ability to move around because of the heavy rain and the muddy roads and the high rivers. So the peak time is from July to really September, and it's peak due to one primary reason. Well, two actually, it's usually the summer holidays, but the primary reason is because one of the world's greatest mammal migration continues every year at this time. It's when more than one million wildebeest will actually come north from the Serengeti in Tanzania. They'll cross the Kenyan border into Masai Mara National Reserve. And what's so famous about this, in addition to seeing one and a half million wildebeest everywhere and their very loud noises, um, there's what's called the river crossing and will cross the Mare River. That means they'll go from one side to the other. But the Mare River is actually a very steep bank, so they have to go very far down, swim across the river, and climb back up the other side. Now, this is a feeding bonanza for the crocodiles who are lying in wait, all the big cats. So whenever they're lined up to potentially cross uh, the Mare River, it's a moment of high drama. And when they go, they go full speed ahead. You know, the wildebeests are not the smartest animal, but they're very instinctive. So well, once they've got a great strategy, which is make lots of wildebeests. <laughs> yes. Because your chances are pretty good if there's like a million of them with you. So, so at this time of year, it's really special to see this unfold uh, over your eye, um, before you, let's say. And because at certain times, 10 to 20,000 to 30,000 wildebeests will make this crossing within 10 minutes. And it's just one of nature's greatest feats actually. So, but it's very busy at this time and the most expensive time of the year. So we went this month in October because this is after peak season. There's a lot fewer people around. You can still see parts of the migration. 
big cats are everywhere. So we prefer to go not in peak season because then you have to share the experience with so many other people and photographers. On one particular lion sighting, there can be 30 or 40 safari vehicles. And it's just a very different experience, one that I like a lot less. So we much prefer to go in lower season, uh, which runs really from October to December when the temperature is still quite you know, temperate. And then January, February, March, February, March, which is also a good time, but it's slightly warmer at that time of year. So those would be the times of the year that I would recommend. All right. Well, that is all of the photos and all of the questions that we have for today. Um, thank you guys for calling us in and taking time out of your Ugandan trek to come answer some questions and share some shots with us. Do you have any final closing statements, anything you want to add, anything coming up in your Ugandan trip? Uh, well, I mean, we have one more day of trekking and then it's back uh, home. Uh, Zach will be going to Canada. I'll be going to the United States, but many more exciting adventures planned over the next few months. So stay tuned. Uh, as always, we're here to help you become the best photographer you can be. And I think I'm just going to close with some final remarks. Remember, it's not enough just to capture a documentary record of your subject, not just to create a literal representation. As a photographer, you should always be striving to be creative with light with composition and the magic of the moment. And I think it's always a good idea to try to find a way to impose your own artistic interpretation on the scene or the subject, because that really is the end game here, I think for all of us, is to create art, create something that's really gonna excite people and that's gonna stand out. So always be thinking about how you can take your creativity to the next level and always be looking for ways to do things different than they've done before, not to just get the same shot that everyone else has got. So with that, we're gonna say goodbye. Thank you everyone for attending this event. This is uh, the first I'm hoping of many live events from the field where we can take the outside and bring it into you and to give you more of that vicarious experience. And as always, we're here to answer your questions and to help you as much as possible. And I'm gonna say goodbye now and let Lilia wrap this up and right. take us through. All right. Bye. Bye. Well, thank you for joining us for this month's uh, October Outdoor Photography Guide. Live outdoor. Wow, I'm really struggling at the end here. Sorry. Thank you for joining us for October's live Q&A of Outdoor Photography Guide. Be sure to join us next month. And I'd like to thank Tamron one more time for sponsoring this live event. And be sure to tune in in November to see what Ian's been up to. So bye.